On this week's Outdoor Elements, we'll take a look at the Eastern Mole and find out how they are actually a good thing for your yard. We'll take a look at how animals are preserved in different ways so they can be studied. But first, we'll find out how you and I can do things to benefit bird migration. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. Perhaps you've wondered when birds are passing through your yard, what you might be able to do to help them, especially during seasons of migration. We're gonna learn a little bit about that with Nicole Nemeth. You're a science teacher at St. Joseph's High School and you've always had a passion for birds. Absolutely. Which is great. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about migratory birds and how we can help them. Right? Absolutely, yes. What is a migratory bird? What does that mean? So a migratory bird is a lot of songbird species are going to be migrating and the reason for that is they will need to move up north so that they can breed during the spring and summer. But then what happens is in the winter it's a little bit too cold for them, especially in this area, northern areas. So they're going to move down south, sometimes to Florida, sometimes all the way to South America yeah, yeah. so that they can spend the winter there. And many of those birds are insect eaters or fruit eaters. In the winter, we don't have any of those available, very right. little, right? So right. that's in part why they have to move. Exactly. You've got an example of a migratory bird. This is one people might recognize from their yards. What is this? Absolutely, this is a Baltimore Oriole. And so we do have these right here in Michiana all throughout the summer season. So they'll come up here to breed during the summer. They are one of our fruit eaters. They love to eat oranges and things like that. And they will actually, in the fall and winter, be spending their time all the way in South America. So they take a big flight. They do, they do. We should mention this is a taxidermied specimen. We call this yes. like a study mount. Yes, it and is. And we're here at St. Patrick's County Park, St. Joseph County Park. Ha St. Joseph County Parks has a permit, right? to be able to keep and maintain specimens like this, right? Absolutely, yeah. yes. So this is an example of a bird that during spring migration, especially you can put out feeders, right? Yes, you can. So feeders, um, they love to eat oranges, as I mentioned. So putting out fruit for these birds is a great way to attract them to your yard. And give them an energy boost, right? Because yes. they're exhausted from migrating, especially, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. So bird feeding is one way that you could help boost the energy of these birds as they're going to and fro. And you've got a great example, maybe we can sit down here, of a homemade bird feeder. Really simple, this is something that kids can do, right? Right, exactly. So it's a great way to kind of get the family involved in attracting birds to your yard, kind of introducing your kids to nature and things like that. So what I have here is just a simple plastic bottle. So it's a great way to use those bottles you're trying to recycle. Reuse, yep. So what I've done here is I've already kind of poked some holes, uh, two towards the bottom and two kind of a little bit higher up. Okay. So they're perpendicular. And then what I'm gonna do is take some dowel rods, which are again, easy to find. And I'm ah, gonna just poke them okay. one through here. And then I have another one kind of perpendicular through here. Will that be the perch? That's where birds will sit? That's correct. So okay. we are going to have a little perch here for our birds to sit on. All right. And so the next thing that we're going to need is a place for those birds to oh, get their food. The seed to come out. Right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do is I just have a push pin because it's a little easier. Again, if you have young children, it might be something you want to help a little bit more with. Yeah. But I'm just going to be kind of poking a hole here. Yeah, okay. And so the idea is we're going to want to have holes probably about here, here, so right where kind of right above your, our perches. So okay. if our birds are sitting on our perches, they then can they the can peck out. the seed out, exactly. And I see on the one that you've finished, you've filled that with seed. I have. And then you've also made this, you, it looks like you also poked a hole and threaded some string, right? So this could be hung. Correct. In a tree or a shrub, or even from a post or a shepherd's crook, right? Exactly, okay. yes. So That's it's a great, a, yeah. It's great. very easy, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I know one other way that um, we can be helpful to birds 
is making sure that there is natural food sources for them. And so the Absolutely. kinds of things we plant in our yards are important too. Absolutely. So how about if we take a look here at the park? I think there's a good example of, of a, kind of a natural area. Absolutely. All right, let's go let's look. Let's do it. I love these purple comb flowers. So why is this a good space for migratory birds? So this is a great space because we've got lots of native wildflower plants. So pl plants like purple coneflower and black-eyed Susan are really great plants that can attract birds and give them a nice source of energy on their journey as they're coming either north in the spring or going south in the winter. And these will um, produce seeds, right? So especially during fall migration, that's, there's gonna be a lot of food sources here. Plus, um, big spaces like this, also, there's a lot of bugs here too, right? Absolutely. Like we can see insects flying all around. So that's another food source too. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And it's kind of a, like a wild space, so um, a, a space that birds are comfortable in. Yes. Um, I think, uh, you know, something else that we can think about if you have windows or you know a lot of birds migrate it at night is there yes. anything we can do about those kinds of issues birds hitting windows nighttime migration yeah. yeah so there's a lot of things that you can do if you kind of can help for windows for example help to kind of there's actually stickers that you can get to help put on certain windows if you're in an area where there's a lot of birds that might be colliding with them mm -hmm. things like being away from large city lights, that can sometimes be difficult, but sometimes city lights can actually be difficult for birds because they get, are relying on things like the stars to find their way as they're migrating during the night. So keeping large lights off, maybe outside your house and things like that, that can be really helpful to birds. Just little things that little you can thing, do. Little easy things. Big things are things like protecting habitat. We've got a really great habitat just down the way here. So why don't we go take a look at that and we can talk more about larger spaces too. Sounds great. Big habitats like this wetland here behind us are places where birds can come and rest, right? Yeah, absolutely. Where or how can just an average person help protect big habitats? So on kind of a larger scale as an average person, you can donate to organizations like the Shirley Hines Land Trust. There's another land trust called Acres right here in our Michiana area that actually work to protect these large wetland areas, forested areas. So all of our natural habitats that birds really need as they're stopping to rest along their migratory routes. Great, so, uh, and then those spaces continue to provide habitat for things like nesting woodpeckers, etc. in Michigan, Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, and even county parks and state parks, and certainly national parks all protect big spaces. So that's Absolutely. a great tip about supporting all of those organizations. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Nicole. Really interesting to think about how we can help migratory birds, and we'll have some links on the outdoor elements website that'll give you more tips. One of my favorite shrubs in the fall is called witch hazel. And the reason it's my favorite is that it has a flower that is actually one of the last flowers that blooms in the fall season. So it's really important for pollinators. Um, but I remember that it's called witch hazel because if you look at this flower, they really are, are very unique and kind of look like a witch's broom. And witch hazel, um, people will uh, soak the bark um, to make a really nice stringent. So it's a good um, native tree that also has a lot of uses. It smells good, okay. I love this plant. This lovely lavender blossom is bergamot. It's a native wildflower that blooms in the summer, usually in sunny spots. It's a wonderful plant to attract pollinators, butterflies, even hummingbirds come to this particular plant. It's in the mint family, so if you roll the stem between your fingers, you'll feel that it has a square uh, sides to it, which the mints do, and you can even use the leaves in a tea, 
uh, or just sometimes I just literally scatter them in a little bowl on my kitchen counter because it smells so good. It is a plant that you can grow in your garden or you might look for it next time you're walking through a meadow or a field. We're here at the Indiana Dune State Park and I'm excited to be joined by one of my coworkers, Mary Strickland. <laughs> she is a resource tech here. And so Mary, your job is really to protect these beautiful, diverse habitats that are all around us, right? Correct. So you get to spend a lot of time outdoors. Oh, all the time. All the time. And so as she's working outdoors, um, she also has a lot of experience with wildlife. And so she sees a lot of critters in the habitats that you're working in. Yes. And one that you're excited to share with us today is a mole. So when you think about a mole, people don't see them very often. What is a mole? So a mole um, is, uh, the one we typically see is uh, the Eastern mole, it's Galopus aquaticus, which actually translates to aquatic blind rat, which is completely ironic because it's not aquatic, it's not a rat. It is blind uh, for the most part, so their eyelids are actually fused. And so they think that they can see light and dark, but that's actually not proven yet. So it's not a mouse, so it's no. not a rat, it's not a rodent. No, so How is it's it not different? a rodent at all. It's actually a group of mammals called an, called an insectivore. Um, so we've got a mouse here so that you can see the difference. Um, so if you notice, the mouse has really big eyes. He's got very large ears. His front feet are gonna be a lot smaller than his back feet. He's got this beautiful long tail that's actually got some fur to it. And he's just overall, very curious, very around, very outside. So then you've got your mole who mm -hmm. is running around. Yeah, he's starting to make a tunnel. So they like to spend a lot of time underground. Oh yeah, so the mole is much bigger. He's got, you can see, you can't really see his eyes. His front, his front feet are much, much bigger than his back feet, which you can't see at the moment. He's got this really long snout, you can't see his ears, and he's got this really cool fur that's a lot more luxurious looking than just a typical rodent. Yeah, so what's so significant about that fur in its habitat? Because having pretty fur and digging around in the dirt doesn't really match up too well. No, so he, because he spends 99% of his time underground, his fur is made so that he can go forwards and backwards in the tunnel and it won't catch. And so he can actually crawl around without his fur getting tangled up. Oh, that's really cool to see their fur, but boy, uh, our mole was sure wiggly. Oh, yeah. um, so we do have a taxidermied mole, Mary. So I was hoping you could break down for me a little bit. I, it's just amazing that th you said their eyes are fused, mm -hmm. but how are they able to really sense out their prey in complete darkness underneath the ground? So unfortunately, yeah, their eyes are fused, so you can't even see. There's kind of a spot there where you can kind of see his eyelids, but this guy's nose, unfortunately, is a little bit shorter than our live moles, but their nose has all kinds of sensory organs right around the tip of it, and they can actually sense out um, earthworms, they can sense out grubs, they feel vibrations in the ground. Oh. And then they will just dig their way with their huge front paddle feet and their small back feet, and they'll just dig their way and they will find all of their food just with their nose. Cool. Does their tail have anything important? I know our taxidermy's tail is really small. Not really. It's short and stubby. It doesn't really have any hair on it. It's just trying to keep it as clean as possible while it's still burrowing underground. So their tail isn't a huge, huge um, help to them. Yeah. It's just mainly to help keep them clean so that they don't have to clean that part of them. So we think of moles popping up in our yard and causing those tunnels and dirt piles. Um, here at the dunes in a more natural wild habitat though, what would be some good spots to see moles? So moles, like most small mammals, uh, follow their food source. Uh, so moles, they typically go for grubs, they go for earthworms, which you typically find in well-drained soils, very loose soils. And moles love those habitats because they can dig very easily through them. So here at the dunes, you typically will find them underneath logs where all the worms are actually helping 
um, deteriorate all the logs yeah. and the wood that's already decaying. Uh, so they'll go burrow under those. Supposedly, they actually will go towards man-made structures. So any of our facilities, our bathrooms, you'll actually find moles trying to burrow around there because all that soil is disturbed. So you're going to find a lot of bugs and extra grubs there. Oh, okay. But then out in the actual woods, you're going to just, you're going to find them all over. They're just going to be everywhere. But again, their permanent burrows are going to be a lot deeper in the soil. So they actually won't be visible for most of the year. So you're only going to see mole burrows, those surface burrows, when their grubs are actually towards the top of the soil. So when it's a little bit warmer, when things are starting to thaw, thaw out from the winter, when you've got a lot of moisture in that top layer is when you're going to see your surface burrows. Okay, that makes sense. So um, also when you think about moles, there are moles throughout Indiana, throughout mm -hmm. Michigan and the area. Are there other species of moles too besides our eastern mole? We only have two actually. So ah. we've got the star-nosed mole, which is more swampy soil. So those are the ones you're gonna see near ponds, near our marsh here. Um, and then you've got your eastern mole, which is pretty much found all throughout the dunes, all throughout Indiana. Um, basically the eastern side of North America, you're gonna find these guys. So they're very, very common. Cool, so they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. So people think about um, being an insectivore, they're eating lots of bugs. Um, and so their habitat that they're in, um, are they really important uh, part of the food chain to have in their habitat? Oh, absolutely. So because of their size and where they are, they actually have to eat 25 to almost 100% of their daily body weight every single day. Wow. So they, um, there's actually some research that suggests they can eat up to 140 grubs in a 24 hour period. Wow, okay. And so people are always trying to get grubs out of their yard. Um, but I also know that it's kind of a, a seen as a nuisance when they're making burrows and nice mm -hmm. lawns and flower beds. Um, is there anything you could suggest for viewers to let them know that's okay or? <laughs> so moles are actually fantastic for your lawn. Even though it doesn't look great, they actually are what helps your soil aerate. Their tunnels will actually help the air get down further so their tunnels can actually go almost two feet into the ground. Wow. So they're helping your soil get the air and then also water that it needs further down, which actually helps all of your grass and your lawn and all your garden roots get water further down so their roots actually can flourish a little bit better. That makes sense. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks for giving us the dirt on <laughs> these really important small mammals that um, a lot of people might think are a nuisance. Thank yeah. you so much, Mary. You're welcome. In the fall, we think of colorful trees and this shrub right here is called the maple leaf viburnum and it's one of the first um, shrubs to turn this bright red color. Um, it also this time of year has these uh, berries um, that are loved by skunks, chipmunks, squirrels, um, even some birds, all kinds of different animals. Um, but this smaller shrub is a really good indicator of a quality habitat and it usually likes to grow in upland soils, um, not, not really wet, more dry soils, um, and is a beautiful native addition to any fall landscape. If you visit a nature center, it's not uncommon to see taxidermy animals, animals that have been stuffed to kind of make them look like they're still alive, or you might see bones or skins or furs or things like that for educational purposes. But we've, and we've used a couple of those on this show in the past, but there are other uses for those things that are beyond education, that they're important research tools. So we're here at uh, St. Patrick's County Park on kind of a gray day, so we're under this shelter here. And we're here with Vanessa Young from St. Mary's College, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about that. So these things aren't just for nature centers. How else are they used? Oh, that's an excellent question. So this is a sampling of the collection that we have at St. Mary's College. And we use our collection primarily for teaching and outreach purposes, but other museums and nature centers will use them for research as well. Um, and so there are a variety of specimens that uh, are in the housed in the collections beyond what you actually see in the showcases and on exhibit. Yep. So got quite a bit here uh, and they're in a lot of different forms. We've got things in jars, we've got things that are kind of laid out here, things in glass. So what, what can you show us here that you have here and 
maybe tell us a little bit about how that might be used. Sure. So what I've got here are a variety of different specimen types uh, representing reptiles and amphibians, fishes, birds, mammals. And I brought this um, array of specimens to kind of show you the different ways in which specimens can be preserved and housed in a museum collection. And so we preserve specimens in a variety of manners because different preservation types can be used for different types of research. And so for somebody like myself who does research on bone shape evolution, um, these skeletal specimens can be incredibly valuable. And so we can actually use tools to uh, measure the different shapes of, or sizes of the bones of different animals. Um, and oftentimes when you see skeletal specimens on exhibit, they'll be mounted like this. Yeah. But when you look at the behind the scenes collections, oftentimes they're actually disassembled and kept in boxes So you can like get this. in there and really look more closely at all those little details Absolutely. and things like so that. Absolutely. So if I wanted yeah. to measure this particular bone, I could pull it out, take the measurements on the bone that I'm interested in, and then put it back in there with the rest of the specimen. Now, some folks aren't interested in bones. They're interested in other aspects of an animal's biology or ecology or morphology. And that's where some of our mounted specimens um, or, or uh, what are called study skins can come in handy. So, for instance, if somebody is interested in looking at uh, bird shape or, or size or bill shape in different parts of the country, they can use these study skins as a way of uh, taking those measurements and get a large sample size without having to affect the natural populations of those birds living in these different areas. Got it. I, I know when I first started my career and I was working at Potato Creek State Park, there were a few of these study skins like this and we had them along really nicely taxidermied things and I didn't know about this concept. I remember thinking, this is a very beginner taxidermist that's not very good, but I later learned that it's more for something like this. So we have those laid out here and you can still learn a lot from those. Absolutely, and so the, you brought up a great point. And like, why are these mounted like this on yeah. you know, little sticks yeah. as bird popsicles, yeah. rather than being taxidermied in such a way that they look like they would be, you know, sitting on a log and in yeah. a waterway or something? And it's a lot of times for space preservation. We have a, a limited amount of space in museum collections, and these things are kept in cabinets. Yeah. And so, if you have a bunch of specimens mounted like this, yeah, that's, that's going to be really room. difficult yes. to store a bunch of specimens. But when you preserve them in kind of this standardized way, it's it is a way to, to keep them well preserved and be able to fit them in the limited space that's available. And you might need, you know, whereas a nature center might have an example or two of one species, sometimes I guess a museum might need several to get an idea of the variety of that particular species, for example. Absolutely. There can be many, many specimens uh, of a single species preserved in a variety of ways. So you may have a, a, a skeletal specimen or a study skin of a given species, and so they need that space to be able to house those. Uh, Again, I keep calling them behind the scenes yeah. specimens. And I was lucky enough to get a behind the scenes tour of the Field Museum in Chicago, and I was always really surprised at how much work was going on. Scientists were back there looking at these things. There were cases and cases of, there was an entire room, and it was, it was cabinets full of beetles. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so I was really surprised at how much behind the scenes work was going on. So that's, that's a neat thing to know that I think a lot of people do miss about the museums. Um, we've got a good variety of birds here. What else do we have? So we've got some mammals here as well. Uh, so I brought a, a couple of different varieties of mammals. And what you'll notice here is, is that some of these mammals are um, preserved as study skins, but because they're small and fragile, they're kept in these plastic boxes in order to make sure they don't yep. get crushed when they're held in storage. I also brought our catalog here. And what this is, is this is a really important tool for uh, letting everyone know what we have in our collection. And it also records important information, such as the, the um, identification number, the catalog number for the specimen, the species name, the way it was prepared, and by whom when it was prepared and where it was collected from. And that's all very valuable information. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, especially because museums will have specimens that come from all over the world. And so it's valuable to know where those specimens have come from, when they were collected, and that allows researchers to answer questions about how organisms may be changing over the course of time as well. Excellent. Well, I know even in nature centers where, where they have the more mounted specimens, they often keep books like this mm -hmm. at Potato Creek State Park where I once worked. They had a very detailed book, and it's, it's very good to go be able to go back if there's a species that you, you haven't seen very much of, but you know that you have it in your collection, you can go back and say, well, it came from here, it came from this person or this county. That's, that's very valuable stuff as well. And one of the things I notice when we look at these birds, that a lot of times when we're talking about birds to the public, they, they say, well, why is that bird called this or why is it called that? Uh, this bird, for example, the yellow shafted flicker, when you see this bird like this, you would think, why is it called a yellow shafted flicker? But 
the shafts of its feathers are yellow, and so sometimes seeing these things up close really gives you an idea of why they got the name that they did. So I find that interesting too. We also have some specimens in jars. What what can you tell us about those? Ah, so another way of pre preserving specimens is to to keep them in a preservative. Oftentimes, it's an alcohol um, prep, and so this allows you to save the soft tissues of the specimen as well. So when you're looking at the study skins here, really just have the skin and the fur or the feathers, um, and sometimes the some of the other um, integumentary structures like the beak or the the feet. But when you have skeletal specimens, you lose all that. You only yep. get the bones, and sometimes that soft tissue is really important for um, um, other types of research that, yeah. that you may want to do. And so having these alcohol preps allow for that soft tissue to be present as well. There's actually uh, several research groups that are CT scanning alcohol specimens. And by using those CT scans, they can look at everything from the skin to the muscle structure, all the way down to the bone and other soft tissue and structures. Then that, and that uh, scan will last for a long time. It can yes. be referenced for a long time in the future. Absolutely. Well, this is all very fascinating. It's a really wide selection of, of uh, specimen that you have here. And it's good to know that these things have some value behind the scenes as well. You know, a lot of times the nature centers be like, ooh, why do you have that dead thing? But they're, they are valuable for research. So I appreciate you sharing this information with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great stuff. Remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. We'll see you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at WNIT.org backslash Outdoor Elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and the Indiana State Park. Outdoor Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.